Before we begin, I'd like to just take a quick moment to let you guys know how much I appreciate the great team here at McCurry's Home Furnishings. They've partnered with me to make this show and podcast happen. McCurry's is unlike any furniture store in Sacramento. Not only do they carry the best furniture in town, they're also family owned and operated for three generations. Did you know that McCurry's also offers complimentary design services? That's right. The same services, which could cost you hundreds an hour, are offered all complimentary with purchase. I love my furniture from McCurry's, and I know you will too. Now, on to the show. <laughs> Well, we're still here, and now we've added a, a great deal of talent uh, that we didn't have before. Mark S. Allen has joined here, obviously part of the uh, movie-making uh, dynamic duo. and uh, Big fan of your show. Still very nervous to be here. A little intimidating. I could see why it would be. Yeah. Me too, with the Blues Brothers here. I, I, I do have to point out, I'm very worried about this high-pressure system that's developing back here. It seems to be coming in from the south area. It's not here in the north yet, but eventually, well, very worried. We will check with Dirk Vadorn on that. Uh, so. <laughs> Dirk Vadorn. Dirk Vadorn is a, one of my favorite meteorologists, but also that's a really good adult film star. I name. totally Don't you agree. agree? Yeah. I agree. Is that phenomenal? That's what you might ask. Yeah, you, should, you should change that up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you probably ought to change that. But anyway, uh, yeah. Evenings with Dirk. One thing about it, though, with, uh, you know, with Dirk and Mark Finan, when they tell you something, that's the way it is. You just weather go, comes first. Weather, there. weather. Really Same does. with Rob Carl Mark and a lot of those other ABC 10 meteorologists, too. Well, they're all good. I mean, really. <laughs> oh, that was a plug for ABC. <laughs> well, they're all, I mean, they're all good. I mean, they really are. I, I uh, just do that. My affiliation or friendship with Ali Trashensky, I'm kind of locked in on Channel 3. You know, I have a little, He'll know. A little biased. He'll know I if you're not biased. watching. I have to admit that I am biased. And, and, you know, yeah. And I love Elliot. Hello. We all look. We all used to work for we're Elliot Trashinsky. Yeah. We're all offspring so of Elliot. We're, yeah, we're, it's all you know loyalty. I'm, we love I'm Elliot. With the old E.T. Yeah, E.T. And uh, he's e. one of the nicest guys in the world, but at the same time, he's a little intimidating. I love you him. You feel like you could end up like in a concrete foundation if you cross him. He yeah. He told me he th came close on you guys. <laughs> I don't, uh, I if anybody see, deserved it, we did. I, I did see the truck a couple times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's not too late, you know. I mean, uh, hit, it's never too late, Elliot. You know, uh, Hitman are out there, and uh, but I think you know, with the cost of bullets, you're both safe. You know, oh, I thank think, God, he, you know, he is a little thrifty, he's a sweeter. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, I. So anyway, let's let's get into the movie business, and 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 really, how did Mark? Did you get attached to Mr. Bird? So I've had my eyes on making movies for my entire life, and, and my broadcast career ended up swinging into movies for the last 25 years. I've been on the sets of movies, talking about movies for my syndicated show. And about 10 years, maybe a little less, Howard said, guess what? I'm going to start making movies. He had, and anything Howard said he's going to do, he ends up doing. And I said, yeah, good luck with that. All right, pal, good luck with that. And you know, a, a year later, he's still struggling, thinking about it, trying to get around the way you start up making movies. A year later, he's already got his first movie, Green Lit. They're in production on his first movie. Fast forward two years later after that, he's got three movies, each a little bit bigger than the other. The last movie, a $25, $35 million movie called Mother's Day with Jennifer Aniston and Julia Roberts. And then, not like I'm a, you know, waiting for you to start winning the battle before I jump on board, but um, our lives intersected to where we could work together. He had a movie called Notorious Nick, based on the true story of an MMA fighter born with one arm. It's this beautiful story that's more like Karate Kid meets Blindside. Um, while that was in early pre-production, I was at this castle called the Preston School of Industry, and I called Howard. I said, Howard, I think we could squeeze in this movie before we make Notorious Nick. And I told him the story before I got to his house. He had done the research and said, we're going to make this movie. And there, there are four people that revolutionized Hollywood in the last 10 years. Tyler Perry, Robert Rodriguez, Jason Blum, and Howard Bird. 
No, I, I swear to you, I put you in that same cat. I'm not kissing your ass because you're my producing partner, but he truly did create a new way, much like Spielberg and Lucas back in the late 60s, early 70s, changed the studio system. These four people have changed the studio system and are making movies their way. That gets sold. That's are seen around the world. Thank you. So what do you have to say friend. to that, Howard? I mean, uh, I'll thank you, my friend. I take Venmo, I, I, PayPal. Well, I think Mark has a good point, is that I said it's time to reverse engineer and stop with the bullshit. When I look at the uh, Mother's Day set and we have 10 drivers and nine of them don't even want to pick someone up from the airport and we have every department is 15 deep, I said, why? This is, there's no reason for this except everybody getting a paycheck that is associated with the studio or whatever have you. I said, we need to run this like a business. We need to have expense versus revenue. And I started looking very aggressively how to make a movie of the same quality with a, an, a minuscule budget of the, pri of the price. Now, you, you obviously had to be probably fought at every turn, didn't you? I mean, uh, when you originally, I mean, when you start something different and going against the right. grain of established uh, interest. I, I, you know, it's funny. I just had a major producer call me two days ago and said, oh, my God, I have this $1.5 million movie, and there's no way I could make it. And I said, oh, is like Spielberg directing and Jason Statham in it and The Rock? No, there's no one in it. And he goes, I can't make it for under three. And I said, you're, you're doing this all. Let, let, let me show you another way. But to answer your question, the only way that I knew I could execute this plan is to control the purse strings. And when you, something nobody likes to do is raise money because it's freaking hard. But again, I go, I go back to sales training. To me, it was just getting in front of people, having a great presentation, giving me an opportunity to invest in something fun, making it very, very realistic that the risk as well as the rewards and make sure it's an enjoyable journey. And we had to control the money because when studios control it, they overspend on every single yeah. thing. Now, as you went along here, I mean, obviously you've had success and, 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 and did a lot of movies. Does it get easier or harder or, <laughs> or, is it, or just the experience? Does it get- I'll let, get, I'll let uh, Mark answer a, that. It's a few doors open that maybe weren't I, there. I, well, I, I think for sure when we call, people listen because they know we don't bounce checks. We produce movies and they all, uh, we're 100,000% we're on all of our movies have had worldwide distribution where Mark has seen plenty of movies that spend 15, 20 times the amount that are sitting on someone's shelf. So it, do you think it gets easier, partner? Uh, you and I have learned some things together. Howard produced the three movies. We've done six together. Apparition, as you know, opened last year, and it's currently on video on demand. We have Ballbuster and Fear Farm opening this year. We have three more in the final stages of post-production. And I would say at each one, it's gotten a little bit easier, only that we've built a tribe of filmmakers in LA and even locally that want to make films and can technically do it on this level. And so we've cohort, we've, we've grown together and gelled into this great moving tribe that moves like a single cell organism. Easier in that way, but we still do buck the system each time we go out to get one of well, these movies. But like in your case, now you, you probably know, you, you know, with your background, I mean, you obviously have an end with a lot of people or, or just relationships, which maybe, does it make it any easier to maybe get your foot in the door? Or, I mm -hmm. mean, obviously it doesn't mean that the door won't close, but I, I mean, in the same way that Howard has a reputation, too, because Mother's Day was was a well-regarded film with some great actors. And Howard's brought a lot to the table in terms of getting in with some of the distributors. Howard brought like Gary Zuckerbrod. We talk about on the casting of Apparition. Pulp Fiction is one of my favorite movies of all oh, time. Yeah, great and movie. Gary was able to wrangle this young millennial cast. Not the Kevin Pollack and Mina Savari are great. But the people you've never heard of before that are in Apparition are tremendous. And so the Howard brings a lot of people like that to the table. And I think I've helped seal the deal a couple Definitely. of times on venues, locations, mm -hmm. this person. I'm the, I've got a guy kind of guy. If we mm -hmm. need a crane and it's three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> I got a guy. You know what? <laughs> I'll say this about Mark. I don't need all those uh, I got a guys because Mark is my broker. I got a guy mm -hmm. because literally 
everything you need. And that's why we filmed a lot of movies here is Mark's fantastic relationships with everybody, whether it's getting us, it wasn't a coincidence. Golden. We got golden one. Um, it was due to Mark. We have a Learjet jet at the airport. It's cause of Mark. We have hotels for a fraction of the price. It's cause of Mark, you know, his contacts are unbelievably. And, and because I think, Mark is such a, a generous guy. He's always giving his time to people. I like his, all his relationships are they owe him one. Mm -hmm. Mine's the opposite. I owe everybody else. But this guy is, <laughs> I owe you one. And so I'm Mark's personal debt collector for him. <laughs> I'm like, well, you need to call that guy. <laughs> if nothing else, I think Howard and I are both stand-up people, both in television production and in feature filmmaking. In his case, we do what we say we're going to do. And there are so many people under the guise of filmmaking that, uh, men and women that, um, are not all that they say they are, yeah. and they don't. And you give your money to them, and no movie ever gets made, mm. yet they've traveled around the world. Whereas Howard and I will sleep in our car if we have to. We, we're shooting one film. I don't want to get too specific because I don't want to throw anyone on the bus, but we were shooting one film, and one of the executives on staff was demanding a suite. And, we're, and Howard and I are, no, it's not. We're putting the money in the film, so let's keep it lean on our end so that more money can go into the film. And, I, I think because we lead with that, everybody else wants to jump in, and it's like stone soup. They want to make the best movie possible. Yeah, and everybody sure. wants to yeah, chip I mean, in. Obviously, something. the word has to to get out, and and people, okay, it's worked. You know, it's worked, and it's worked, and it's worked, and uh, that uh, that has to be a positive. Some uh, Howard had a paradigm shift on the set of Mother's Day, like he said, where he saw that money was not being put on the screen; it was being wasted this way and that way by having five cars when you need one car to get cast to set. Um, and he instilled in me this same thought process. And so I used to be on the set, at Leavesden Studio in London on a Harry Potter set, and I would call Howard and say, look, they've got lobster tails. <laughs> Every day, Craft Services has lobster tails. And I would be bragging, thinking that's the best thing in the world. And now I look at that as just what a tremendous waste because yeah. somebody earned money that. that went into that film that, that they're hoping this, they're banking on this movie to make its money back. And yet, they don't need lobster tails, put that money into editing or another day of shooting or whatever it takes. But, but yeah, the idea of, you know, got to have a suite, that kind of stuff. You no. Know, it's like, really? Do you? You know? Uh, and look, I mean, Ma Mark and I, when we make movies, we take a salary, and it's extremely average salary, and because we are, make a living, and this is how we pay our bills. But what we're counting on, unlike any other movies, is we own a big chunk of it. So we look at it like at bats. So we know one of these movies, that's how a studio operates. One movie will pay for two years or three years. So we take small salaries just to keep our cost of living expenses so we can do this full time, so we could actually follow up on everything properly and do it all right, especially when you've done 10 movies. <coughs> um, but then we're betting on it's, it's a big hit. And if it's a big hit, everybody wins. And mm -hmm. something else that we focus on, we've given a lot of people in Sacramento opportunities to be in a worldwide film business. Some have taken advantage of them, and quite frankly, some have not. Yeah. And so yeah. are you gonna talk to everybody and go, oh my God, I love Howard Bird. Uh, no, because some of the people that didn't perform, I let them know about it, and they're not working for us anymore. But most of the time, people have flourished in those opportunities. Well, I've, always, wait, I've always said, though, I can't, you know, I don't think I've ever talked to you about didn't think you, you got such a positive thing. I always call Howard. Uh, he's like a protein. He's positive, you know, <laughs> proton. I mean, <laughs> protein. It's protein and proton. You it's know, true. Either way. Yeah. You know, Mr. Positive. And uh, but, you know, I, you got to at some point, though, I mean, it's like anything. You kind of got to be the bad guy a little bit, you know. Well, when you're a coach, you know, being in the movie, you're the CEO of every project. Sure. Mark and I and, and everybody don't get a play it, 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 and if people aren't playing well. You have to let them know. Now, you do it in a professional manner. I never yell at anybody off the set, on the set. If I see somebody getting yelled at, I immediately pull them away and say, you don't treat people like that. Um, so the policy is always kindness but firmness because you can't accomplish a huge thing like getting a feature film made, funded, edited, and then selling it unless you get maximum. Our job is to get maximum performances out of people. And if you're not doing it, you're not part of the team. It's no, no coincidence when you look at the movie and you're like, where did so-and-so go and so-and-so go from the last movie? People know mm -hmm. they don't deserve to be here. Well, yeah, fa you know, fairness and, right. and uh, is always... People don't like deal. to hear that. No, But that's the honest way well, to run yeah, a business. I mean, I always say, like in, in coaching, there's always, I don't care how fair and, and, and you are, there's always three guys aren't going to like you. Yeah. 
The trick is to make sure it's the worst three. <laughs> if, if, you're right. If Amen. The, but you know big, what? If your best three don't like you, you you're, you're going to be doing but something else. But it usually else. works out that way. That sure it's the it does. Worst three because, oh, it because does. they're not getting what they want because you won't give it to them because they're not earning it. Yeah, yeah almost ninety. I always said too. You know, years ago, I, as a college coach, I'd always uh, start the season. I'd have the players vote on who should start. Now, invariably, it'd be the same. The guys that that I thought should start. Sure. You know, I mean, they get it. Right. You know, they'd even, I remember had a set of twins once and one, one twin didn't vote for his brother to start, you know, and, and he shouldn't have, but it's like, wow. You know, he said, well, he's not one of the five best. It's honest. Right. You know, but I mean, honesty, I think you get, get people, put them on the spot. It's like, okay, you know, produce. I will say this about Sacramento. We have some tremendous filmmakers up here for Apparition. We blended some Northern California filmmakers with LA-based filmmakers. And there were many on the set. It was blurred. You couldn't tell who was who. They were all operating at, at an equal level. And we have a lot of people that live in Sacramento that are working on major movies around the world that just choose to live here. The same reason Howard and I choose to live here. Well, it's a great place. Oh, you know, it is. I mean, I'm, Compared to Los Angeles, it's, it's a, a great easier. place to, to live. I mean, obviously, I know a lot of our neighbors are people who have re retired uh, from San, you know, and moved from San Francisco or Los Angeles and get the same house for, you know, half the price. And that, and, right. and still, you got a great climate. Uh, great place to live. And it a great place to shoot, too. Now, I mean, we live here and make movies here, but truth be told, Hollywood's been coming to the Sacramento area for years to make movies because it shoots like 12 different North America locales. It can look like the Midwest. It can look like California. It can look like yeah, the Southwest. It's pretty amazing. Where you, go. you know, really, I mean, of course, California in general, I mean, just as a Midwesterner, I always said if you, you know, you grow up in the Midwest and around, if it's bad weather, well, go 500 miles, it's still bad. <laughs> uh, and it ain't any different. You know, here, you, you know, two hours, that you, is, you can uh, change your world. Right. And uh, which I do a lot. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> you know, That's you sweet. can change. I mean, it's just it's just marvelous that way. I think uh, native Californians probably take that for granted. Exactly. How does it feel being a major motion picture star? I should be asking you about your feature film performance in Ballbuster. Well, you know, it's it's uh, I, it should have happened a long time ago. Obviously, with the, <laughs> You're late the obvious talent that I have. No, I, you know, it's it, it's obviously a blast just to get uh, like I say the. Speaking part is fun to do, and, and you know, like the Nike commercial that uh, Grant and I did, it was a blast. You know, you, yeah, it's just something you, you, you know, I always say you look back on and think, yeah, I never thought I'd get to do that. You know, it's so fun. It's, it's, yeah, it's fun. It's really a lot you of fun. You know, I mean, it's like do, it's what we're doing here. You know, it's a, another experience. Sure. You know, and it's like some of the things we talked about. Uh, some of your experience, both of you. I mean, you have some some life experiences, whether it's globe totters or or doing doing things in a radio career. You know, you, you look back and someone was saying, "Well, why did I do that?" And somebody think, "Yeah, that was yeah, it was fun." Yeah. I, I was watching your podcast with Howard when you were talking to him about his days with the globe trotters. A lot of the story in Ballbuster. Ballbuster, by the way, which comes out later this year, is the most ridiculous collection of on-the-road basketball stories, some of which, you probably didn't know this, are based on true events in this guy's life. I, I could kind of guess that, you know, and I mean, he, he might have been uh, Jerry McConnell. <laughs> oh, no doubt. That movie was, yeah, I mean. <laughs> Although I think he probably could play the game a little better, but that's, you oh, know. God, I don't know. This may be inappropriate, Jerry, but we are in a furniture store, one of the most acclaimed furniture stores. So I got to ask Howard, is it true that one of the most remembered scenes, one of the most talked about in testing scenes of Ballbuster featuring a person how do I put this for a family audience? To not disrespect Jerry's set, but there's a scene in Ballbester where one of the players in many countries would be legally wed to a mattress. Did that scene really take place in real life on uh, the road? A hundred percent, yes. In I, Lubbock, I, Texas. I, I, yeah, I don't really want to follow up on that, but, <laughs> but I will. I will. I, uh, I will say this. His one, name was Mattress Mike. Let me, as I recall. Let, me, let me tell the funniest story about how Mark was casted in Bomb Buster, and uh, which, which he said on a previous podcast, we were around with the director and we said, oh, there's this lady. Um, I had just watched the Detroit Lions <laughs> run in for a touchdown and someone threw a giant dildo in the end zone. And they had to have a hazmat suit 
<laughs> no one would touch it. And yeah. all the people gathered around <laughs> it. And there was a <laughs> house guy in a hazmat suit came down and picked it up and said, what the frick? And I said, that is really funny. So I said, Mark, I got this great idea. I want a woman in the audience to take out a giant 12-inch dildo. And I want them to throw it at Jerry O'Connell, but not hit him. And I want everybody to stop yeah, like, what the yeah. <laughs> Just like that. Yeah. So Mark isn't... I love Mark. He's just not a sporty athletic guy, except he's a good swimmer and other things. So I said, first great of all, swimmer. great swimmer. I said, Mark, you know, we'd like you to play the woman, which he was okay with. And I thought he embraced it. Really <laughs> I thought well. it was a joke. It came up in a conference yeah. call. I didn't know that I was so, really going to be. Which surprised me. Like, he had his own outfits, but that's another story. But um, <laughs> had his own wardrobe. Yeah, by that was a little weird. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. It's not time. mine. So, anyways, um, the funniest thing is uh, this thing probably weighed a good three or four pounds, as you'll see in the movie. Wow. So we're the, the guy yells action. The director Tommy and. Mark hurls this thing from the fourth row in the bleachers, which is standing vertically, and hits Jerry square. <laughs> For a guy who you just said doesn't have a good arm, would but you say that? But you weren't really? supposed to hit him, though. <laughs> Well, I wasn't supposed to hit him. That's right. He was supposed to land at his feet. But so when you, when you got the great arm, I mean, I mean, it hurt. Power. And Jerry, I, I, I'm convinced, went into shock. But he was such a freaking pro that he just like. Did that really happen? Shook it off and then went and picked it up. And I, we were just dying um, in the uh, video village. And that, that's just one of Mark's great stories. The, no, I won't tell him that story. Mm. But um, please tell him about Lunell at the end, speaking about Jerry's character, okay. this was really funny too, a funny story. And I think you, you saw the movie at a test screening, so you may have seen this. The end credits are gonna have this scene. Because someone grabbed their camera to shoot it. So there's a scene where one of the characters has ingested, unbeknownst to him, um, something equivalent to Viagra, if not, and can't relieve the situation and needs to relieve the situations immediately. So they're trying everything. <laughs> Lunell decides that maybe exposing herself might alleviate the situation, might counteract its effects. And so... Off camera, the director and Howard and I, we explain, hey, Linnell, realize this is just a sight gag. Right. We're shooting you from behind. From back. So you just open your robe, but just know that you're to remain clothed at all time. We're just simulating this gag. <laughs> yeah. We don't expect you to do it. So he goes, I know, this is not my first rodeo. Well, then the locker room gag happens uh -huh. where she turns to expose Jerry O'Connell. She's played a joke on us, and she's taken off all of her clothes. <laughs> And opens to all glory to Jerry O'Connell, who, once again the pro, who's probably just been knocked senseless by a three-pound dildo, doesn't react, does nothing, <laughs> and finishes the scene. And then the director goes, okay, cut! The entire cast starts dying <laughs> laughing. <laughs> Lunell is livid. Jerry O'Connell, how dare you? I give you the greatest gift. You know how many people write to me that want to see what you got to see, and I get no reaction from you? I give you my natural God-given assets in full glory. And just goes off on a tirade, and that we made cut that that's my favorite yeah. part of the movie. That, so, that was good. So Jerry wasn't as appreciative as he should have been, is what you're saying. Just razor-sharp Meryl Streep acting focus on that wow. guy. You're not going to break character. Oh, boy. And, and, yeah, if you saw the goods, you, you, you're impressed by... Jerry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, 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 I'm amazed at some of the stuff you guys. Uh, you know, and and also, that, that is some of the favorite things about Mark as my partner is, is, as I like to say, we have the highs together and the lows together. And it's just even the lows are funny when you look at it a day later. And I'm his um, producing partner, by the way. Of course. Did you think anything else? <laughs> well, it happens. Like, we'll be in restaurants, and Howard will go, have you met my partner, Mark? And the waiter will go, I told you so. That's, <laughs> that, that's only when we sit side by side reading a script. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Not to that there's anything wrong with that. I'm toasting just saying, each other. Understanding. There's nothing wrong with that. So, and that's the funny thing. Mark and I were, were amazed at some of the situations we're in. And we just laughed. And that, that's the great thing about making movies with, some, with your friend is that the stories are just, every movie, they're just wonderfully <laughs> ridiculous. It's personality, each one. Yeah, and we just yeah. laugh it off we, or yeah. else we'd be crying. And yeah. when you go to, to, to Los Angeles, let's say, I guess, to sell, do you, I mean, do both of you go at the same time or you talk to different people or is that kind Most of, of the a, time, a, yeah. team, a team kind of thing? Yeah, it, it's, 
It's definitely a team. And, and the first time I went to a meeting was uh, with the guy. What was the a studio that did Twilight? Do you remember? Lionsgate. Lionsgate. Okay. So this is a quick funny story on teamwork. This is uh, before Mark. I go into this meeting and this lawyer we had was extremely arrogant, thought he knew everything. And he actually insisted on going to a meeting to Lionsgate to pitch uh, Four Minute Mile because they were very interested in producing it. Um, we walk in there and all you see is this giant tote board in front of the executives and behind the executive desk. How much money by the, by the minute Twilight series is making. Mm -hmm. Then on the side, he's got two fully, lot, fully full size wolves stuffed that were from Twilight. I mean, they, they were huge the yeah, yeah. in the movie. So we get, <laughs> we get done with this meeting and we're all just on pins and needles. You know, we're all on our best behavior. I told the lawyer, do not talk. You don't know the show business. I know you want to get into it eventually, but the best thing in the room, if you don't know what you're talking about is don't talk. And he goes, okay. And I could just tell he wanted to interject. Yeah. Someone. I'm like, mm. yeah. And I'm, I'm definitely the kicking guy under the table. I will kick the crap out of you if you think you're going to talk and I see it. I will nudge you. Mark, Mark I've done it a couple times. I've got yeah, right. scars on my shins. Yeah. So, <laughs> get some show. So, so right. pads. here it is. Things are going good. And I see the guy get up and he veers towards the executive. And I'm like, oh shit. And I try and screen him out, my basketball skills. And he lays this beauty. He says, hey, what's with the stuffed dogs? <laughs> really? <laughs> like he's never seen Twilight, thought they were stuffed dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Made it an equal playing so, field. Though. To answer your question, Mark and I go in there together, and we work really well together. Um, when I did sales training, I say let's. I used to script out the, the fundamental things. I'd say to the person I was training, "What do you want to accomplish from the call?" And then make sure you have a goal in mind to get there. So Mark and I are always, you know, professionally. We said, "Okay, what's the goal of this call?" Mm -hmm. And then him and I work on it together. I was gonna say, together. yeah, get a little strategic. Like we do. We definitely get going, strategic. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know. I, the funniest thing about Mark is that um, I'm I'm definitely usually the bad cop, and Mark's the good cop. Well, that seems to yeah, I can yeah, see that. But but Mark <laughs> Mark's Mark, turning. Mark has a has a, a glitch in his personality that I absolutely adore, and it's like a Hulk component. And for some reason, <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> that one time, and you won't let it I've go. I've never seen anything like it. Mark has a, like his tolerance is here. Mm -hmm. Mine's here. Right. For some reason, this one person, Mark had had it to here and probably 10% over that. But I had never, my whole life, I've never seen Mark. He's the nicest guy ever. Well, the guy, the guy for some reason said something to get him over the 110%. And my, I've never been prouder. Mark went on a freaking tirade <laughs> that the Hulk would be ashamed of. I just remember no, no physical violence. It was all verbal. And the yeah. guy deserved yeah. the no, guy deserved it. No flesh wounds at all. I was so proud of him that I almost had tears. I wanted to go, that's my boy. I just remember cursing for like 10 minutes straight, <laughs> like reenacting a scene from Scarface. And then I stopped talking and I thought, oh, thank God the connection dropped. So they didn't hear any of that because there was silence for about 15 seconds. And Howard said, are you done? <laughs> I was scared. I was scared. But that's the journeys and the adventures together. Like if Mark and I had a reality show and they, they went to these meetings and they see the crap that we pull off and what we do and we end up making the movies, it would be extremely entertaining. But um, that's the kind of thing I love getting to know Mark, uh, spending a lot of time together. You know, you're on the road, you're making movies. These set days are 16 oh, hours. Sure. Um, and Mark's just a fantastic movie partner movie partner yes right. got that and, movie and Howard's partner. a great spinner. and friend with no benefits um but uh, when physically. you guys go say meet with a, a studio head uh do, you obviously got your agenda you know now you know they've got theirs right so you you do you kind of factor all that in saying oh well, this is this is what we we need or want, and now, the, but we know that this this would be might be their their slant. Well, the biggest hairs are split at the very end of the game. The one thing that I will say about what we do, we go in with this tremendous calling cards. Like I don't like to brag, but the truth be told, the movies that they see, the dailies, or even the roughest cut of any of the six that we've made, the studio wants the film. They already know they want the film by the time we're in their office. So it's really just down to the the. Crossing the T's and dotting the I's and negotiating, and, negotiating. Yeah. and that's where this guy is king. Mm -hmm. and, and in the negotiating, I mean, obviously, there's there's always 
there's a range. Now, and, and I guess the trick is to realize the high point of that range that they would do. I mean, and, and I guess you have to. Well, what, what happens when you work with a distributor is if you're any producer that doesn't have the studio behind you and you're an independent movie and someone goes, we want to distri distribute your movie, you're like, oh my God, let's celebrate. Let's go to Sizzler. This is amazing. We'll do it. And then they give you a 65 page contract that you know nothing about and you're basically signing it saying, please go sell this for me. Because you're, you could tell the world, you've got a distribution deal. Now when everybody comes back and no one gets their money back, you're like, what the hell happened? Right. So what Mark and I have managed to do in, in our last five movies is finally I said, we need to turn the tables. We're gonna, not everybody's gonna like this plan, but we don't need everybody, we need one. We need one that we like that has a good reputation. And we went out and we asked for it. And at first they're like, no, I don't think so. And I said, okay. You know, we also have these three other movies coming out. And sorry, you know, we don't, you're not going to get those if you don't help us with these. And so we went back and forth, back and forth. And finally, we have a deal where um, it's a lot more lucrative. We took a smaller commission, but it's higher mm -hmm. in the waterfall. So right off the bat, our investors are going to get money as opposed to this grand illusion of a high percentage of little tidbits of steak, you're actually getting a piece of the steak at the very top before it's eaten. And that is what I feel our biggest accomplishment has been in the last, out of all these movies, is having the balls to ask for it. Ask for it and have, you know, have the, the, the other movies to, to use as part of the negotiating, right? And that, yeah. that uh, has to help uh, and, with, and the, with the proven success. I mean, And I it's a win-win though. Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, the thing I'm, you know, it's very difficult to negotiate when you have nothing to, to negotiate. Yes, right. With. I mean, certainly we've all leverage. been there. You know, it's like yeah. you know the old. Uh, well, I'd like to have make X number of dollars. And they say, well, no, here's Good for you. <laughs> right. This is what we're paying you. And you think, okay, <laughs> right. That's it. <laughs> well, like, Good for you. Yeah. Well, wish you well, but so we'll get the, it here. The next, and, and Mark and I are about to start raising money on our big new project called the Extractor. And we feel when we unveil the business plan, besides the high concept of the movie, which is amazing, um, it, it's even, it does get a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Now, are we making guarantees? Hey, you put in this, you're gonna get your money back. No, because we're not slick willy, we're not yeah, gonna say can't. that. Yeah, but we're no gonna way. say, here's our plan. This is how we're going to make the movie. This is how we're gonna sell the movie. Now, at some point in time, we have to let it go and hopefully people like the movie, but mm -hmm. this, and we're gonna make it for X amount, which is extremely reasonable, and we have a budget we give to people, we're very transparent. Here, we have a uh, full-time CFO that does all of our accounting, so there's mm -hmm. no shenanigans going on, and we just have a concrete plan that people are interested in. Most people don't wanna invest in, in the movies because they think it's too much of a flim-flam. They have no, no one in Sacramento People that have done it, like the lady that uh, was in Elk Grove, and, and I, I guess in my opinion, I have to say in my opinion, she didn't fulfill the right. movie studio. You, you're go you have that misnomer out there, and then when Mark and I have a meeting and talk about movies, they're like, what about that? And that person can get my money back, and that, well, I can't control them. Yeah. But this is what, this we're, is what doing. we're going to do. And it's a risk. It's a freaking risk. Well, of course. Every, the, what, what I think is funny, a lot of our money is in mutual funds and things of that nature. We don't know one person who works at that company in your mutual fund. We don't know their business plan. We can't call them up and go, hey, what's going on with that launch? Mm -hmm. Or our, at least our investors have full access to us. And we keep, we, I like to think we keep them informed every quarter. Here's what we're going. Here's our plan. Mm -hmm. Here's what we're doing. But we invest all of our money in things we don't even know about, which uh -huh. is crazy. Mutual funds and pray that market does good. But it's, you know, it, it is what it is. It is what it is. It I, is what it is. Well, it is. I mean, I'm just, I'm just amazed. You know, I mean, obviously, you guys, uh, the success you've had, and kind of changing the business, so to speak. You know, kind of getting a. So I guess it's like anything. You know, you, a person that kind of gets out ahead of it, you know, uh, has an advantage. Now, I, I would assume probably aren't there people now that saying, hey, you know, in a sense, saying I'm gonna. Uh, Try to do cause well, a lot of the things. It's things hard work. Let, let me let mm -hmm. me just say this. I I had an executive from New Line that worked there seven eight years ago. Call me and go, how the hell do you make a movie for that price? 
Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, the yeah, Deborah Morris is behind the Austin Powers and a ton of other movies. She's auditing us, looking at our books and saying, how you got that done for that amount. Mm -hmm. But but here's the problem. You know, the business model now is like a Netflix. Mm hmm. The movie Irishman, what do you think? Like 100, 200 million? million? 100, yeah. With all the actors? Just under 200 million. Okay. $200 million. Okay. So if I ran that studio, I would make that movie. I would have one star in there. I would make that movie for $10 million. Mm -hmm. And I would take someone like Mark and I and go, you guys have $50 million. I need you to make 20 movies. Because you're only going to see it one time on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And all you want on Netflix is a good entertainment experience. You don't need to spend two hundred million dollars for a one-time movie that's going to be on yeah, Netflix. What, what do you think their motivation was for that? I mean, obviously, getting all those big stars, extremely expensive, and all that was it. You know, it's maybe, branding. Netflix yeah, well, wants an Academy say, Award. Yeah, more more of that. Put it right. in the right. There, get a bunch of awards. It's worth it to us. You know, losing X number of dollars right. maybe. Right. To do it to to do this for Netflix. Uh, with Disney and other things uh, getting involved in, in the same business. Think right? how competitive, you know, right. what I always tell Mark and everybody, everybody needs one thing right now, content. Mm -hmm. So keep coming with all these streaming things because I want to walk in to Netflix. I want to walk into the movie theaters to Lionsgate and let the bidding begin because mm -hmm. you need high quality products. Mm -hmm. The thing is that tough as producers, we have to accept that sometimes our movie isn't going to be opening in a theater. You know, right. you didn't get in the movie. To, I didn't get in this business to make movies that people see on their phones. You're right. I wanted the glamorous experience, but I'm also s smart enough to know times are changing. Yeah. You know, when my daughter looks at her phone all day, she's not watching it on this and that. So you have to kind of put your ego out of it and do what's best for the film. Well, that's the, the, the problem with, this, you know, I know with the NBA now, the overall TV ratings are down tremendously. 20%. Well, some of it's due to streaming. And, and all that, but I mean, obviously, if you're ESPN or Turner Sports and you're paying hundreds of millions, yeah, that don't that don't float the boat. You're losing money. Sure. I mean, so you know, it's one of those things where they're probably going to have to sort things out. It's like you know, a lot of young people will watch the game on their iPads or or, or phones, or they're not watching they're because not watching. there's too much content, too, sure. much, too much stuff out there. And, and I mean, and so so that that sets a whole thing dynamic, I think, in place to where uh, all of a sudden you may not. You know, the, the house of cards may be leveling off a little bit. Well, you know, there you, needs to be a correction in that business. Yeah. And the correction is your uh, fifth best player on the team shouldn't be getting $20 million. Well, and I, I think, think we the, see that happening right Well, now. I think the, uh, you know, it's all based on, uh, the salary cap's based on revenue. So, right. you know, and that's in a high percentage of that is due to the TV. And so if the next uh, negotiating deal is, does not go up, and that's, that's always been the thing, it's like it's always going to go up well. Sometimes, or sometimes right. you may not. Is yeah. it a conspiracy to get the money down and they're not really down 20 percent? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, well, it, who knows? I, I know, mean, I, you I, know, it's just one of those things. I'd like to know how they do figure ratings sometimes, you know, with TV and all that. But uh, yeah, you know, just well, it's done electronically. You know, mm -hmm. your, your TV is monitored. And you have, I think they even do it through the app now. Um, but it's simply they have the Nielsen ratings and certain times during the year or yeah. every day they do Well, the I'm ratings. convinced, yeah, they, that they're watching me take naps, you know, with the TV on. <laughs> still counts. Yeah, right. It still, still counts. But and TV's especially on. with, like, Alexa listening to you in the background. Have you ever said something in yes. conversation and later it popped up on your Facebook That's feed as so an weird. ad? Yeah, yeah, I don't deal with Alexa. Or I, I, I've made a point. I don't talk to my car. I don't talk to... <laughs> Someone in here has. I heard an Alexa when I was watching your show earlier with Howard. With Someone, the lights. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Alexa, order Ball Buster. <laughs> yeah. Alexa, one apparition. She's taking a nap. We'll be yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, man, that stuff is way past my pay grade. I know my wife, you know, get, you know, Alexa and all, and all that stuff. You she know. get. Yeah, but it's like, no, no, I don't. I'm not talking to my car. I'm, I'm not talking, you know, because. Might be a smart ass. I'm just not gonna do it. <laughs> they do call them smart ass listening. Yeah, yeah. So or smartphones. Right? Yeah, it's true, right? But anyway, I... well, I can't wait for people to see your work. Your life is going to transform tremendously when Ballbuster erupts on the oh, big well, it needs, because it the needs transformed. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, when uh, people start seeing it later yeah, this year, it, it's going to go nuts. It, it needs transformed. I, I think the, you know, I I, I want to be in a gangster movie as a hitman. I, I think mm. I, that that's write my, that down. Let's, let's make that. It's up here. It's up here. You know. You know, I mean, it's like, 
you know, if Joe Pesci can do it, I can do it. I can do it. You know, I'm about as little and ugly as he is. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good looking man. You put on your resume. I'm little and ugly. What do you got anyway, for me? Well, I think we've uh, maybe covered everything. I think I, so. I, I tell you what, it's really been enjoyable. And, and really, informationally speaking, uh, you guys are really doing some marvelous things. Very Thank interesting you. to me. You know, I, I hope uh, you all out there have enjoyed it as much as I have. And Thanks for having here, us. Here Thank at you. the beautiful uh, McCurry uh, uh, studio. And, and headquarters. And, and headquarters. Uh, so... We'll just see, but uh, thank you, Howard. And, thank you, and Jerry. Mark. Uh, you guys We're not are, worthy. Good guys, to be here. You guys are the best. And uh, so uh, until next time, you and have been oh, on yes. the Jerry Reynolds podcast. His blue sweat is still making those eyes pop. It's popping. They're popping.